Yeah, it's been a great coincidence. Uh, all these talks have really been booting on each other. Um, as Kevin said, yeah, I'm David Smith uh, from Microsoft. And today, I want to talk to you about a process um, for deploying R to production that fits within the DevOps lifecycle, and I'll talk about what that means. I am going to be using some services in Azure, like you've seen in some of the previous things, but everything I'm talking about uh, applies quite generally. I just happen to be using some Azure services to make this work. Now, you've probably heard uh, about DevOps in several talk talks during USAR this week. Um, if you haven't heard of DevOps, um, it's basically everything that you need to do to streamline and, autom streamline and automate the process of bringing software into production and usable by people. Um, there's lots of definitions for what DevOps is out there. Uh, one that I really like um, is one that comes from Duncan Brown, who's one of my colleagues uh, in the Cloud Advocates team at Microsoft. And he likes to say that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. And there's a link there where you can sort of see more details about that. But I think one of the interesting things about um, Duncan, uh, Donovan's de 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 definition there is that he talks about delivering value as opposed to delivering software specifically, because it applies to all sorts of technical developments um, that incorporate software, that incorporate hardware, that incorporate data. And that's going to be particularly relevant in our case here when we're going to be talking about delivering um, machine learning applications in general into production environments. And I'm using machine learning here in a very general sense, um, talking about applications like self-driving cars or computer vision, which is kind of what people tend to think of you know, at this very moment when we talk about machine learning. Uh, but I think it uh, applies equally to more traditional data science and statistical type applications. Uh, things like forecasting, uh, things like predictive maintenance, things like making recommendations uh, in shopping cart systems, uh, genomics. We saw Martin's amazing uh, keynote about Bioconductor yesterday. Things like that are going into production as well. And these are all things that are routinely done using R. So the kind of thing that I wanted to talk about in the time I have here today is to talk about a DevOps process for bringing these types of applications written in R into production. I do want to give you one example just to motivate uh, the discussion today. And it's one that's not particularly R related, R -related but I find it really useful to kind of crystallize some of the issues that come up here. Um, this is actually uh, comes from a talk that I saw at ODSC, the Open Data Science Conference, uh, late last year. It was a presentation by the head of AI at Tesla. Uh, Tesla, you might know, is a manufacturer of electric vehicles. Um, Teslas uh, do have an automated driving capability, which uh, is driven by a camera that sits on the windscreen just in front of the driver. Um, that's not what I'm talking about here. Uh, but that camera is actually also used for another feature in Teslas, uh, which is um, there isn't a manual control for the windscreen wipers. The windscreen wipers come on automatically when the car detects that it's raining. And how does the car detect that it's raining? It does that by analyzing the image that it sees through the camera, and it tries to look to see if raindrops are detected on that camera. And if it detects raindrops, then it turns the windscreen wipers on. Now, that sounds simple, but as you can imagine, the process of detecting raindrops in a camera image is not trivial. And that's done using machine learning techniques, specifically vision techniques. Don't want to go into the details of exactly how that's done, except to say that uh, in the early days of this feature, Teslas had a problem, according to this presentation that I saw. And that problem was is that if you were driving into the sunset, and it started to rain, or if you were driving into a tunnel while it was raining, the automatic windscreen wiper feature wouldn't turn on or off as was required. And I think what's really interesting about that problem with respect to DevOps with machine learning is how you solve a problem like that. Because what you don't do is go into the software and do an if then else, you know, if it's after 6 p.m. and you're driving west, do something different, or if you're in a tunnel environment, do something different. No, the way you fix a problem like that is to drive some Teslas through some tunnels while it's raining, drive some Teslas into the sunset while it's raining, capture some imagery that's relevant to those specific situations where those problems occurred, and then retrain the artificial intelligence vision model 
using that new data so it can recognize these new situations and operate in the correct way. So that's a very different kind of resolution to a problem in this machine learning operations context than it is with traditional software development. And that's kind of what I want to focus on here is there are some special considerations for MLOps, which is a term used for DevOps in this machine learning context that are different than some of the tra traditional software development cases. Talking about people, process, and products from uh, Donovan's de definition from a couple of slides ago, the first difference there is that there are different kinds of people that we're working with here. It's not just software engineers, IT people, application developers, and so forth. Into the mix, we also have data scientists and machine learning engineers, which, as we all know, have very different ways of working uh, with data and with software. The process of actually building, developing, testing, and deploying these models can be quite different. Uh, the first one here, data as code, is a way of representing that problem I just described. You know, the way we actually fix problems in systems is often with more data, as opposed to programming and changing actually lines of code. Um, we've all gone through the process of building statistical models. We know that there's that life cycle around of experimenting with data, trying out different kinds of models, finding out what kind of predictions worst work, putting that into a real world environment and testing those results on an ongoing basis and continually tuning that model as we go. And that's somewhat different from traditional software. Even testing means something different in this context. You know, we can talk about building tests in traditional software, which is basically, you know, does the software break in these particular kinds of conditions and make sure that doesn't happen as we're building the software. But tests in a machine learning environment mean something very different. Uh, imagine, for example, that your application is a vision system which is intended to estimate the apparent age of somebody from their face. But what does that mean to be working or not working? You know, we don't know what somebody's actual age is. Is it supposed to change if they put on a hat or they're in a, a low lighting condition or image from the side? How much variability in an estimate of age is acceptable in our particular model? And that's really gonna depend on our particular kind of application and what we're using for. So testing even means something very different to this particular context. And also just the deployment framework is, is, is atypical here. We're typically not building uh, standalone applications. Uh, typically in this machine learning context, we're deploying APIs, HTTP endpoints, as we saw in the last couple of presentations, that other systems are going to be used to draw in the results of this machine learning and put that into other applications. And then on the product side, you know, we're dealing with different kinds of hardware and software. Um, GPUs, for example, are commonly employed in a lot of these machine learning models. That's something different we have to deal with. We have to deal with different kinds of streaming data and storage systems. And of course, the software we work with is going to be different as well. Uh, rather than traditional programming languages, we'll be working with things like R or Python or perhaps machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow uh, to build these kinds of models. And we need to be able to deal with all that here as well. So what I'm going to show you now is a DevOps process um, with R based in a product called Azure Pipelines. I'm using that one because it's the one that I'm familiar with, it's available to me, but if you've been using anything like Travis CI or any other of these CI CD type applications, the same um, principles apply. Um, Azure Pipelines is a nice one because it's completely agnostic. Uh, we can use it with any language, uh, we can use it with any, pla any cloud, uh, any platform, and we can use it with any resources we have, including our own or in other cloud systems. Uh, we can extend it, and in fact, that's what we're going to be doing to extend it for some MLOps capabilities just here. And on the deployment side, it plugs in really, really nicely with containers. We just saw in our last presentation the way we can package up um, an R function as an API into a container, as we're doing that in just a moment. And then we can scale that container into a cluster uh, with Kubernetes, and those things are built right into this Azure Pipelines product. So one of, the, one of the things that I did for this talk is to basically provide a minimal example of building a pipeline uh, with R, and you can find it here in this GitHub repository. Um, Azure Pipelines, you can work with any sort of source code controlled tool you like. I like to use GitHub, GitHub, so that's where I've set it up here. The principle is pretty simple. You just set up an ordinary GitHub repository. You put in, the, in your data files. You may have static data files that are uh, imported on a, on a scheduled basis. You may have scripts that import into a live data store, like a database or a data lake. 
Um, once you've done all that, same as you do with other CI CD systems, is you define a pipeline of steps to take that involve booting that application. And you do that as a YAML file. I'll show you an example of that just in a moment. And of course, you want to have the classic status badge uh, incorporated into your GitHub repository, and that's really easy to do there as well. Once you've set up the GitHub repository, you're probably going to edit that with your favorite R editor. In my examples, I was using RStudio and just using RStudio's nice GitHub inter interaction feature so I could just check in and check out things really easily. And with that, then within the Azure Pipelines environment, I just define the triggers that cause my package to build, uh, my, 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 um, my pipeline rather, to build. I'm not doing an R package here, just to be clear. Uh, I'm just doing a set of R scripts that are running as part of this build process. And in this case, it's going to be triggered anytime there's a check into the GitHub repository. And then we can set up pipelines to actually build things, which in our case means training the model and exporting as a, an R model object, which can then be used in the deployment phase. And in the deployment phase, that's part of our release pipeline to actually take the model object we create, package it up into a container, and expose it as an API, as we've been seeing in some of those previous talks. So here's the basic process. I think I've actually gone through most of this already. Um, we create um, our GitHub repository and we put our YAML file in there. You can just see a small expert of the YAML file here on the right. A couple of things you'll notice is that we're making heavy use of containers, uh, and that's typical in this type of case. Um, this is just using ordinary Ubuntu 16.04 containers in this, uh, sorry, virtual machine hosts in this particular case. And I'm using Rocker containers, which we talked about just as a moment ago, which include ordinary R, in this case, R version 3.6.0. Um, I've used a very minimalist uh, Rocker container in this particular case, just including R, and I've chosen to install the additional packages as part of the build process. That has its trade-offs, forward and minus. As I'm developing things, I can just write additional scripts to put in additional containers. Once I've got it settled down a little bit more, what I'll then do is go back and actually build a brand new container, including the packages that I'm using, so I don't have to go through that build step every time. But it works well as you're getting set up. Um, like I mentioned, I'm just using an RStudio project to connect into that GitHub repository. I edit my R code, my R script files, put these steps into the YAML file, as you can see here. So here's just two simple examples of just running a piece of R code in line just to check the R version as part of my process. So I can always check in and make sure I've got the right container. And then here's just another example of running a bit of R script to train a model and then export the uh, results of that model out as an R model object to be used later on. Uh, once you've got that all into um, Azure Pipelines, every time you make a check into the Git repository, this kind of thing happens. Here's an example where everything succeeded. Um, if things failed, we get um, notifications in here about the steps that didn't work. I get all the output uh, from R and any other scripts that have been running directly that I can look at, and look at uh, in this screen, figure out what's wrong, go back to RStudio, correct my code, and keep on going through that process until my builds uh, are succeeding. We've talked a lot about containers. Um, it's really uh, sort of inherent to this process. We have some great examples of containers in the last few minutes, but you know, one thing to remember is just containers are a reproducibility environment for software. So it just makes it really easy to specify all my R versions and packages and so forth. We've mentioned the Rocker project a couple of times already. It is a really, really great resource for anybody using R, uh, so R with containers. Uh, Dirk and his collaborators have done a great job of doing that. You can get access to any version of R you need. Take a look at the Rocker project there. I haven't gone into too many details about deployments in this talk because other people have gone through them already today. Um, but one thing to mention is that you can deploy your R predictions once you train the model as a container really, really easily using the Azure Containers uh, package written by Hong Lui. Um, despite the name, that actually works with any container platform. Uh, I just happen to be using it here with um, the Azure Container Service. And you can provide all the details uh, at um, the Revolutions blog at the link you can see right there. So we can actually stop the talk at this point. You know, you can just use all of Azure pipelines or any pipelines, any uh, CI CD service you like, use regular old plain R, build an application and deploy it uh, to the cloud using these services. But I do want to talk about one other thing here, and that's some of the unique um, problems you might encounter in a team-based environment. 
If you're working by yourself, everything I've talked about works great, but if you're working in a team with lots of other data scientists, machine learning engineers, perhaps application engineers, perhaps database engineers, um, a little bit more infrastructure we have found is useful to help those teams collaborate. For example, for me to experiment with a particular model, track the performance of that model as it's training, and for my colleagues to be able to see that and perhaps look at my model and decide they want to use it in a production environment as well. Automating the process of validating models and, and writing tests, as I was talking about before, and making sure those tests are complied with as we bring new data into the system automatically. And all the steps we need to deploy that model in a scalable way, scalable way and be able to monitor it in production. Uh, Microsoft ha does have an orchestration framework to do all of that. It's called the Azure Machine Learning Service. Um, despite the name, it doesn't actually do any machine learning itself. You just use whatever machine learning um, tool you like, whether it be R or Python or anything else, and you can put it into this system. Um, it does have today a Python SDK, and that means a Python package that you use to control the system, but the actual computations can be done by anything behind the scenes. Um, basically what it does, the Azure Machine Learning Service, is provides you with some containers, no, that's a bad word, some objects in the Azure Cloud that help you to manage the results of experiments, so builds that you've tried with a particular model, to uh, register models that you think are ready for deployment, and then, for example, to actually do that deployment itself. Right now, as I mentioned, the Azure Machine Learning Service SDK is only available in Python, but I'm very happy to announce here uh, that the Azure Machine Learning Service will also be supporting R quite soon. I've actually been working with some early builds of it. It's not available to you just yet, unfortunately. But just to give you a teaser, you can see there's an R package coming. Um, it's currently called Azure ML, but I think it actually might change its name by the time we release, that lets you interface with those Azure Machine Learning Services uh, artifacts, experiments, models, deployments, and so forth, and control that all directly within your R environment. And once you've done that, you can then tie it back into the Azure Pipeline CIDC service I mentioned. So as you've written your scripts, for example, to build a model and then register that model within the Azure Machine Learning Services system, the DevOps, uh, the, uh, the, the Azure DevOps pipeline system can automatically detect when a new model is registered, kick off a brand new build system, perhaps deploy it directly to Azure container instances as a single container so that you can test and validate it yourself. And then when somebody approves it to go into the production system, it'll be deployed into Kubernetes. Um, so you have a scalable cluster of containers ready to support uh, a big application. So when we put all this together, we get a complete machine learning operations workflow, um, putting the data in Git, um, developing it as a pipeline in the CICD system, use your Azure Machine Learning Services to control all the artifacts, deploying it into production, having it run, and then completing the circle, looking at places where it's failing in production, perhaps adding in new data, and then rebuild training the model going right round again. I know that's a very complicated diagram, but I will give you a link to a complete paper that describes that entire process in just a moment. If you want to try all of this, if you want to try all of this, um, Azure Pipelines is free to use uh, for all public projects, so great for all your open source stuff, and even for your private projects, you can run up to 10 parallel jobs at a time uh, across all of the supported operating systems. Azure Machine Learning Service, the same way, is free for all of the artifacts that are in there. Um, you can actually use your own compute, own compute resources and do it for free. Um, or use the Azure services and pay for them as normal. And that's it for the talk. Here are some references that might be useful for you. And thank you very much.